Welcome to the UK Travel Planning Podcast. Your host is the founder of the UK Travel Planning website, Tracy Collins. In this podcast, Tracy shares destination guides, travel tips, and itinerary ideas, as well as interviews with a variety of guests who share their knowledge and experience of UK travel to help you plan your perfect UK vacation. Join us as we explore the UK from cosmopolitan cities to quaint villages, from historic castles to beautiful islands, and from the picturesque countryside to seaside towns. Okay, and welcome to the UK Travel Planning Podcast. This week, I've got guest Karen back again to talk about all things British food. Um, we recently did a, a podcast live, or did that with uh, Victoria in the Facebook group, and we got lots and lots of questions about um, foods. So um, myself and Karen have been chatting away, and um, we decided we would do a little bit of a podcast and have a chat about um, the foods that we enjoy eating when we're in the UK um, and give you a little bit of context about what sort of things that you can expect uh, when you're there. A little bit about pubs, a little bit about how to save money as well when, you, when you're in the UK because um, food, it, eating out is pretty expensive. And if you're trying to budget, there are things that you can do. Um, also, the fact that um, there are different names for different foods in the UK as well. So so I thought I'd kick off. Uh, would you like to just say hello? Sorry, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Karen. Um, so yeah, we've we've done a couple of podcasts before as well, haven't we? So yeah. We just thought we'd, we'd, we've got so much to say about food, so it felt like a podcast <laughs> on its own. But we, we went back to the UK for a visit. So just to give you the background, I'm from the UK originally and now live in Australia. And I've been over in Brisbane for about eight and a half years now. And last year, um, in September and October, we went back to the UK for six weeks um, myself, my husband and three kids to, to travel around and see family and, and catch up with everybody. And it seemed we ate all the food while we were away because my husband's a bit of a food obsessed. He really <laughs> missed a lot of food in the UK. So we did a lot of um, eating of a lot of different food in a lot of different places. And actually, it was where nearly all of our money went was on food. Oh, I know. <laughs> it is definitely expensive. And actually, so we, we, um, I've just recorded a, a previous podcast with um, Karen, which I will link to in the show notes because I'm not quite sure at this point which episode that will be. But there will be a link to to listen to Karen talk all about her um, six-week trip back to the UK with her family last October. And also, if you do recognise Karen's voice, it's probably because she is the person who does the intro to the podcast too. Um, so let's start talking about food because I, I I love food <laughs> as well. Um, it could be a long podcast. Yeah, it could be. It could be. So I think the first thing let's let's talk about the sort of um, the sort of foods you might find when you visit the UK. So what you're going to find are that there are regional variations, so specialities to different regions. So I grew up in the northeast of the UK, so in Northumberland. I grew up very much on my grandmother's um, home cooking. She used to make her own bread. So, and she had used to have exactly the same food at exactly the same day of the week. So she followed a very regimental structure. She also had four small me- meals a day with my grandfather. So I kind of grew up in that culture in the kind of late 60s and 70s. So, you know, I, I absolutely love uh, any of the foods that she used to make. So I'll start with my one of my favorites um, when I'm back is, is have a, a roast dinner. So um, a Sunday roast is a big tradition, isn't it, Karen? Yeah, every single Sunday growing up. And even now, my mum and dad still every Sunday make a roast, even though it's just the two of them. They'll get like a little mini roast now that they make. Um, But you can have roasts in pubs. um, You can have carveries in pubs where you've got all of the roast meat laid out and all the vegetables and you can kind of keep your plate as high as as it can go. Um, But Sunday roast, like... It, it was something that was a non-negotiable in our yeah, house. Yes, absolutely, up. absolutely. I think actually Doug would be happy if I'm in a roast dinner every every <laughs> Sunday. Yeah, but it's a bit too hot, so it's I too don't. Hot in Australia. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but for so I know it was something I was discussing with uh, Wendy in uh, I think podcast thirty two. Because she was over in the UK, she found it really difficult to to find a Sunday roast. I think it's worth if you go to a carvery, they probably will be on all day. But generally, if you're going into a pub or a a restaurant for a, 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 a Sunday carvery, it tends to be a lunchtime thing. So it'll finish generally about four and you will potentially, well, I would book to be honest, because it is a popular thing and people will go out with their family, meet up to have a Sunday roast. So if you're going to be um, in a you know popular destination in the UK, then I would consider definitely 
making some inquiries and booking a Sunday roast if that's what you want to do. And the most important part of the Sunday roast has to be Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> Absolutely. It has to be Yorkshire pudding because I'm from Yorkshire. So it's just something that we grew up with and it is delicious. I have Yorkshire pudding. Yeah, I absolutely love Yorkshire pudding with it. I've had sausage and mash and I have to have Yorkshire pudding. So if you're in York, what you can also do, I'll put that, we'll just mention this as well. Um, and I, I know we mentioned in podcast number uh, three when we talk about York, is if you're in York, you can have a Yorkshire pudding wrap, um, which is, it's basically the Sunday, your Sunday dinner in a huge uh, Yorkshire pudding that you fold over um, and, and you, you eat that. Oh, it's it's delicious. Um, and I know lots of people have stopped off and had a, have a Yorkshire pudding wrap when they've been in York. My kids were literally asking me if I can make that for them yesterday. So oh, really? I haven't tried making it at home yet. But yeah, we and like being, I don't know whether it's a northern thing, but we used to have Yorkshire pudding with any roast. Traditionally, yes. it goes with roast beef. But my family do it with what, whether it's chicken, pork, whatever the meat is that you're having, it always has to come with the Yorkshire pudding. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't matter. It, yeah, it's, I know the traditional thing is that it's it's with roast, roast beef, but actually most people will have it with any. And you can have a large uh, Yorkshire pudding or make smaller Yorkshire puddings. There is a bit of an art to making Yorkshire pudding, um, which basically once you've got the batter mixed, you've got to make sure that the fat, which you've put in the oven, is red, red hot. So you bring it out, put the batter mix in and put it in, and then your Yorkshire puddings will rise. That is what my mother has it's, told me is the secret. It's easy. It's equal quantities of, of plain flour, milk and eggs whisked up yep. until it's smooth, bit of salt and pepper and in a really red hot oven. Yeah. And yeah. I can say that because I'm from Yorkshire. So yes, you can. I make good Yorkshire puddings. Absolutely. <laughs> I have to say that my grandmother made the best Yorkshire puddings ever. She really did. And um, I kind of, yeah, I still miss those. I can still taste those wonderful <laughs> Yorkshire puddings. So um, another thing you'll find um, across the UK, kind of is not, not a regional thing, you'll just find everywhere really, is good fish and chips. Um, fish and chip shops everywhere for um, take, but they used to be when I was a kid, you'd get them wrapped up in newspaper. But I think that, that, got, that got stopped a few years ago. So um, you'll still get them wrapped around in paper though. And they'll ask if you want, um, you want your salt and vinegar on. Um, they'll ask about if, if you can always ask for scraps as well. Do you want to explain what they are? So scraps, again, some places have regional words for this, but scraps are like the little bits of batter that are broken off and they give you a big scoop of them on top of your chips and they're bad for you. <laughs> <Really good. delicious. laughs> um, so some places call them, because I, I, I grew up, well, I was born in Sheffield in South Yorkshire and then I grew up in Lincoln and I, I've kind of hung around with people that say varying words and then I moved down south. So I've heard words of scraps, bits and scrumps ah, are words okay. that I've for them. But I tend to go for scraps or bits as the most likely. I think scrumps is more of a Lincolnshire word. Right, okay. Um, but they are really good. You can ask for those. They're free on top of the chips. While we're talking about fish and chips, something that I forgot to mention in the previous podcast when we were talking about that we did around the UK, um, we made the effort to go to a tiny fish and chip shop in Lincolnshire called Upton Fish and Chip Shop. It only opens twice a week for a couple of hours. It's this really tiny, quaint little village in the middle of nowhere, and they've got this really ancient coal-fired um, fish and chip shop where every, like the chips are cut by hand in front of you and it just you queue up at this tiny little cubicle doorway to order your food. And there's quite a wait sometimes to get it, but it's a really unique experience. And we took the kids there and it, it, it was great fun to just do it just for the experience. I bet they really enjoyed it. And it's it's um, if you go for things like the takeaways, like fish and chips, it, it, it is they're not overly expensive. I can't off the top of my head think now the prices and I, I will check when I'm over in the UK. But, um, you know, it's a cheaper meal to go and get a takeaway, some like fish and chips. And certainly something to, to do, a traditional thing to do if you're a seaside resort, for sure. Just watch out for seagulls. Yes, <laughs> yeah, well, that happened to me once when, <laughs> when we were, I think we were in Weymouth and I had this, we just bought a really lovely big uh, tray of fish and chips and I was sitting on a bench and a seagull came over my shoulder and took the whole piece of fish. Wow. And kind of took it, picked it up and threw it on the floor in front of me. And then hundreds of seagulls oh, came down. I can imagine. And yeah, so now I'm very paranoid about yeah, you, chips outside. Yeah, you have to be, yeah, because they're huge as well. The seagulls are massive. So you have to be really careful. Even like if you've got an ice cream, you have to be careful yes. with seagulls. There's usually signs actually saying, I think I remember in St. Ives, all these signs said, be, beware of the seagulls. So another kind of head up towards um, towards Scotland, um, which is kind of I lived on the border of Scotland, is um, one of my favourite foods when I'm back is to have um, haggis, neeps and tatties. So um, obviously haggis, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, tatties, potatoes and uh, neeps is turnip. 
So if you get a chance, if you're in Edinburgh, um, my favourite place to go is Macca's Gourmet Mash Bar. They do a small portion of haggis, sneeps and tatties, which is delicious. And I recommend that to everybody. So even if you just try it when you're over, if if it's, uh, I say I won't talk about what actually haggis is. <laughs> I've never tried it. Have I you not? Do it. Oh, I do it. oh no, I, it's absolutely delicious. And a lot of people have actually have tried it and said, oh, they really enjoyed it. Um, so it's so something worth trying. Um, another uh, favourite in the UK is a fried breakfast, a full English breakfast or in Scotland, a full Scottish. So with a full Scottish, you'll pretend to get a bit of um, haggis and some oat cakes. If full English as well, you'll get a, a black pudding or white pudding. Um, again, I won't discuss what they're made of. Not always. You, what I mean is you don't always get those. Oh, you don't all, no, no. Thankfully, because I think they're horrible. But um, <laughs> my husband loves them and, and he will sometimes have, add them to a full English. Yes. But they're not on every... It's, no, you might get offered that. It might be a potential to have that. Yeah, because uh, like if you say in a and b you might not get those. It, it's, you know, you'll usually get your um, sausage, egg, tomato, beans fried bread, um, kind of stick mushrooms. Those are, those are the staples of the of a, a fried breakfast um, with those additions of potentially that oat cakes and haggis, black pudding, white pudding. But if you get the chance again, if, if you know, try it if, if you want to. So we're, we talked a bit about carveries because we mentioned about um, Sunday roast. So um, a carvery um, is a great, often they've got it, they're also like a pub carvery. So it, it will have a carvery attached to it so carvery is it's a bit more kind of relaxed where you can go and you kind of help yourself to the vegetables um but they will carve up the meat hence the name carvery um so again usually very child friendly um those sort of places i know have been a lot so they've got kind of you know places for kids to play as well in those sort of pubs so i know to, uh, talking about pub meals i kind of guess from that as well um is uh, you can go uh, pub meals basically fish and chips, um, gammon steak, steak and chips, yeah, scampi and chips, pie, yeah, yeah, maybe pasta dish. Yeah, they, they've got. I find that they do a really good variety of meals on the pub menus in the UK. Yeah, there's definitely things that are on them on their menus that aren't on the menus generally here. Like yeah. you, you'd get sort of mate, you might get a risotto, or you might get a pasta dish, or you might get, as I say, lasagna or something that you don't necessarily always get on the pub menus in Australia. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, so usually quite a, a large variety of those and you'll pop, you know, have a, a bar that you can go and get a drink or alcoholic drink from as well. And quite often you'll take uh, your table number and go to the bar to order food. Um, sometimes they might have waiting service as well that, that they might do that. But most of the time with a pub, you just take the number of your table and you go to the bar to order it. They might have a different corner of the bar that's just for food and it usually will have a sign above it saying order food here or something um but if not just go to the bar and just just ask about ordering food with whoever's serving behind the bar yeah and if you're again in a smaller place um you might need to inquire about booking it especially at weekends um i know when we were in cornwall last year we we went to um a pub for a, a pub restaurant for a really good meal but again we struggled to make sure that we could get in um because they were quite busy um, other popular dishes in the UK that you find is um, curry. I'm not a massive curry fan. I'm, I'm, I love yeah, curry. I do like curry. Curry's I, my yeah. favourite. And yeah. we really miss a good British Indian curry. Yeah. Like it's, it does taste different in Australia. It's just, yeah, we really enjoy it. So you've got lots of actual curry houses there, but you've also, they'll often put curry on the menu of a pub as well. Yes, absolutely. they'll have a curry night as well. So mm. you can often go and they'll have, um, you know, for, for a reasonable price, you know, they have a choice of different curries. Um, and obviously, there's lots of also um, takeaway restaurants uh, in the UK. So takeaways, um, so Chinese takeaways, um, Indian takeaways, you know, the fish and chop, uh, fish and chip takeaways. So you can always just go and go and order pizzas as well. You can get on takeaway. And I know somebody the other day asked me about an app. So I need to have a look at that, which would be the best app to have a look at. For kind of making for rent, just find out about restaurants, what's an area. Oh, actually, that's interesting. When we were traveling, we um, ended up spending a night in LA on our way back, and we used Uber Eats to order food to our hotel. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah. we, we found that was quite helpful just to be able to just grab some dinner. And um, like if you've got the Uber app anyway, yes. um, you can just have a look at it and you can plug in from what location and you can have a look at what restaurants are around in the nearby area so that yeah if you want to yeah take away that's really that's useful to know 
one of the things, so I guess bangers and mash, mentioned before bangers and mash with gravy. So gravy is a big thing as well. Oh, okay. My kids' favourite toad in the hole. Yeah. Which isn't really a toad in a hole. <laughs> Would you want to explain what that is? <laughs> so it's sausages cooked in a big Yorkshire pudding. So like in a, usually in like a big square tin and then you chop it up in slices and serve it with mashed potato and gravy. Although maybe it's a weird southern thing, but my husband and his family have it with baked beans. That's a weird sound. I think it's a sound because I think I think that's beans, no. with gravy. Yeah, beans, yeah, gravy definitely. Yeah. I don't know again because I'm because I'm northern that we certainly like our sauces and gravies. Yes, more so I think than than well, I'd probably be controversial, but from people from the south of England, I, think, I would say I so. Because right, yeah, as I say, I'm northern too, and yeah. my husband's from the south coast, so we have different ways with our foods. But um, yeah, toad in the hole is a big favourite. Definitely. And then, um, so then we've also got things, if you pop into uh, Greg's Bakery is probably the the, the biggest chain of, um, of bakeries where you can pop in and get takeaways. So you can get your bacon butty. So you can get a bacon sandwich in the UK. And somebody was saying that they found it really difficult. But honestly, bacon butty, go to Greg's. Really, if you go to any greasy, I'm going to call it greasy spoon greasy cafe spoon as well. Cafe That's is what they're where called. You get where, you get an, uh, where you're having a breakfast, you should be able to order a mm-hmm. bacon sandwich. Bacon roll, bacon back, whatever you're going to call it. But we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say more of market venues might call it a bacon sandwich. Yes, they, bacon butter. Yes, they <laughs> or, and also you get um, HB brown sauce in the UK. So obviously there's ketchup, so tomato sauce is popular, but also brown sauce. HP sauce, brown sauce, which I, I personally prefer. Doug always says tomato ketchup, but I, I like my brown. That's a northern thing as well, though. You see, I don't do brown sauce. Don't brown sauce. Really? I like ketchup. Yeah. Ah, no. Okay. So if you get a chance, try a brown sauce. Um, and then obviously things like pork pies, sausage rolls, scotch eggs you can get. These so, are my husband's absolute all time <laughs> favorite foods that you're mentioning all right there. Yeah. The things he lived on while we were traveling around. It was just every time we stopped anywhere, you turn around and he'd be in a baker's buying a scotch egg, some cheese straws, some sausage rolls, <laughs> and a pork pie. <laughs> well, it can't be a pork. Honestly, pork pies are lovely. And then, so should we explain what a scotch egg is? Go on, you. Talk. Okay, so a scotch egg is basically it's a, a hard boiled egg, and it's wrapped around with mince meat so that it's it's round. And then it's dipped in breadcrumbs and then it's fried. And it's delicious. Absolutely delicious. It's served cold. And it's served cold, yeah. Um, but honestly, absolutely delicious with a bit of brown sauce. <laughs> <laughs> I'm spotting a trend here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you get a chance to try Scotch egg, you'll find that again all over the UK. It's pretty, um, yeah, it's pretty, I don't know if it comes from Scotland because it's called Scotch egg. Maybe it does. But um, but it, again, it's pretty popular, like pork pies, bacon bodies, sausage rolls. Um, oh, and then if you're going to, obviously, down to Cornwall, Cornish pasty. Yeah. Well, while we were travelling, Matt made it his mission to have a Cornish pasty everywhere because even though they obviously originate from Cornwall, you can get them all over the place. But he really did feel that the best ones were from the ones in Cornwall that he had. But he did try them everywhere just to make sure. But he did find a really good Cornish pasty shop at Gunwolf Keys in Portsmouth. Uh-huh. Um, and I think there might be a chain of them. It's all right. Something like the Cornish pasty. I think so. so. I have a feeling Doug had one in Bath, actually. So they're they're interesting because part of my ancestry is from Cornwall. I always find it quite interesting about the the Cornish pasties used to be for the men to take down the the tin mines. So um, the fact that you've got, because you've got like a thick out edge, which is kind of um, scalloped, I guess is the best way to uh, describe it, is what the men would hold to eat the pasty because they'd have arsenic on the hands. So to stop them getting poisoned from the, because they couldn't wash their hands when they're down the mines. Um, they would use the thick crust and hold on the, the the actual pasty. And one half of the pasty used to be savoury and the other half used to be sweet. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, so you'd get the, the meat and the veg and then on the other side you might get what, a bit of apple. So you'd get the whole meal in one. Oh. Yeah, so that's kind of the – but, yeah, we we had some absolutely delicious, delicious Cornish pasties when we were back last year, that's for sure. Well, my husband loves um, a little bakery, a village called St Agnes in Cornwall, and he – swears by the sausage rolls and Cornish pasties from there that they're really good um, but he did really really like this one that he had at Gunwolf Keys in Portsmouth and so I think this chain seems to have nailed the recipe just right. Oh and one thing I have to mention before because I know I can hear Doug saying it right now is that what about Marmite what about Marmite, Marmite so Marmite so is very very popular it's 
absolutely delicious on, on a hot toast with a bit of butter and then spread the Marmite on. But it really is one of those things where you love it or hate it. So Marmite originates from Branston, which is in the um, town from where my husband comes from in, in, uh, in Staffordshire, uh, Burton-on-Trent. Oh, is that so, why he yes, loves it so much? Well, I think he just loves it anyway, but it, it's a, it was a side product of the brewing industry, which was a um, feature of Burton-on-Trent. Um, so, so it comes from there. So we, have, we always have Marmite in the cupboard. And when you're in the UK, you really should try Marmite. Yes. Um, I know a lot of um, Australians don't like it because they kind of compare it to Vegemite, and it's very, very different. Um, to me, it tastes very different. So much better. Uh, it's a lot better. <laughs> I, I also agree Marmite's a million times better. Controversial, those Australians are going, no, I can hear them shouting, going, no, it's not. Um, but you can get amazing Marmite-flavoured things as well, some Marmite-flavoured crisps. So that's another thing in the UK, get lots of fantastic flavoured crisps. But Marmite-flavoured crisps, Marmite-flavoured biscuits, Marmite flavored chocolate, even which Doug really enjoys. So look out for Marmite. So you, if you're in a staying in a B and B, you might get um, Marmite on the you know the breakfast. To spread I was just going to say that was really good when we were back staying in hotels here and there. Um, we you know like you get your little pots of jam. They do little pots of Marmite. Yeah. So we grab a few to keep. So we've got a few to keep going during the trip. That's a good idea. Yeah. That's a good. Idea. Now, now I'm thinking I want some toast with some Marmite on because <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy it. I think, oh, we'll talk a little bit about puddings as well, because we've kind of talked about, oh, we'll talk about jelly deals, actually. So, oh. so <laughs> the, like, to. yeah, I'm going to mention it because I think, um, because both myself and Karen are from the north. So we, again, like talking about these regional variations and, and I guess it's a bit, I don't know if it's a bit cliche or a bit, but there's like certain areas that you'll go, will will associate with certain foods. And so jelly deals is kind of a popular, I don't know if it still is, but you can buy it in, in London. Um, in the um, east end of London, um, jelly deals. And there was something else we were talking about before, with liquor, was it? Pie, pie mash. Yeah, with liquor. liquor. Yes. It's not actual it's... liquor, as in it's like a clear liquid, but it's not it's not alcoholic um, that you can also get in London. I've never tried that. I've never tried them. No. We're, we're not, we're, we're northerners, we're not Londoners. <laughs> <laughs> Don't all try that. Us, but the idea of jelly deals just... No, it no. doesn't... Um, <laughs> But I guess I think the places in London, I'm going to be doing a, a food tour in, in May at Borough Market. So if you're in London, um, a great place to go and try. Uh, I don't know if you can get jelly deals. I just have to tell you this in, in Borough Market. But Borough Market is a great place to go get all sorts of different foods, British foods, international foods. Um, so, so that might be a good place to add into your itinerary if you're in London. So just talk. I think we'll talk. Oh, we'll talk about puddings because I did mention those. So puddings in the UK, you've got things like eating mess. Uh, which is a personal favourite mm. of mine, uh, which is basically raspberries, fruit, uh, meringue, meringue. Uh, wrapped with cream. And a, I mean, it's, it's hugely fattening, but it's absolutely delicious. I would say British puddings are really typified by hot puddings with I was custard. I just going to say, <laughs> yeah. treacle pudding is yeah. the first one that came to yeah. mind, and apple pie. So again, with that Sunday roast, that would always be accompanied by something like that. My mum would always make a crumble, a fruit crumble, a pie, or a pudding. So it would either be treacle pudding, apple and blackberry pie, something like that, or a rhubarb crumble or something uh, like that. So my grandmother didn't make those because I don't like any of those. <laughs> I don't particularly like hot fruit. So um, we never. So we used to have um, custard with jelly. So she'd make a jelly. We just to get we'd choose whichever flavor we wanted for the following week, and then rice pudding with jam because she used to make her own jam. So we'd have those, but I mean, Doug's, Doug absolutely loves all those. Um, I call them stodgy puddings, but you know, they're, they're, they're kind of hot puddings. You can get certainly get them in most uh, places you go. And I know like treacle pudding, spotted dick. There's just roly pole. There's all sorts of bread different and bread and butter pudding. That's another thing. I, because I don't, I don't tend to eat them. I'm more a cold pudding, like trifle, bake well, um, tart. I like that sort of thing. And you can have them served as you like. I don't have like custard which is a bit controversial but um you can have them with cream or with ice yes. cream yeah you instead. can so yeah. like especially if you're ordering in a pub they'll say to you what do you want with it you don't have to have it with custard but that is the traditional way to have it. yeah definitely or and i'll just mention something briefly about um food allergies i don't have any food allergies but it was something that was mentioned to me um by by some uh, americans i was talking to last year is that they were quite impressed by how much it is mentioned on menus in the uk um about what the ingredients are so you can check or the mail ask you if you have got any um allergies so it's worth kind of if you're if you're going to go to a restaurant for afternoon tea or or whatever to to mention that as well just bring that up because i think um i, I know that people have been quite impressed about how how seriously it's taken in the uk so i just did want to mention that because I, I can imagine some 
possibly somebody was thinking about and that. I think over the last few years, it's got more so because I um, am intolerant to dairy and just don't have, I can have a little bit of it, but not a huge amount of it. But it was used to be very hard to, to get soy milk in different places. And, and now you find that you can get a variety of options, oat milk, and almond milk and all different options when you go to cafes and things, whereas it used to only be more places like Starbucks and things that were more um, in tune with that kind of thing. But now I feel like when we went back, there was a lot more variety of options. And then I guess we'll talk about um, drinks. So, yes, I am a typical English in that I love my tea. I can drink potentially, I don't know, I could just drink constantly a cup of tea. Um, I like milk in my tea. I don't do cream. I've, I've heard people say that they put cream in their tea, um, but you wouldn't find that in the UK. So it, it's a tea bag um, or tea leaves in Doug's case. Um, I just like normal standard kind of um, tea, but there's also the different variations um, uh, of tea when you go over there, but expect that they will ask if you want milk. Um, and obviously coffee, I don't, I don't drink coffee, but I know you drink coffee, Karen. So mm. how did you find that in the UK? I do. Um, I definitely think obviously Australia is better for its coffee. Mm. Um, we take it a lot more seriously over here. Um, I know that when I moved to Australia, I found that a bit of a culture shock getting used to ordering coffee over here because it was, you had to sort of order a flat white or a long black. And there were different words for things. Whereas in, in a lot of the sort of basic cafes that you've got in the UK, it's, a white coffee or a black coffee, which is just a white coffee is just the hot water and coffee and milk, um, not like a flat white that's kind of steamed milk. Um, so they're different things. But when we were back, we found that most places now, a lot of them were were doing the option of the flat white and the more cappuccinos and more kind of different variations. So it feels like it's really come forward a long way with its coffee. Yeah. Um, there was definitely a lot more, um, a lot more options over there that, Still, if you go to like your kind of greasy spoon cafe or whatever, it'll be, do you want milk in it or not? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basic, yeah. Okay. And then, um, so, um, oh, I was just going to mention briefly as well about, because we were, we were asked the other day in the Facebook Live about the difference between a pub and a bar. So, um, pubs you'll find, that a village may have its local village pub, you know, the Red Lion or, well, I can't think, the King's Head, whatever they're called. So, there's certain... Um, typical names you'll find a pub um so every village will have its pub and that tends to be where you know the locals all hang out everybody will know each other whereas a you know bar is a far far more kind of um you'd get dressed up to go to a bar you'd get cocktails in a bar you tend you wouldn't find a bar in a, in a village you, you know you might find a, a wine bar in a, in a town um and certainly obviously in places like london or edinburgh any of the, the major cities you're going to find you're going to find bars but you'll also find pubs and pubs tend to be um where you've got sort of the local community hang out like I know my dad would go to the pub to play dominoes or to play darts and things it's a, a community gathering place whereas the bar is more a place that you would meet drink with friends to go on somewhere else somewhere else, else or, yeah yeah um but I mean you, you can go into any of them to, to have food they still do food in bars as well yeah. they do food in pub you don't you tend to find that the locals in a pub will sit along the bar yes like to chat to, yes. The, to the staff that work there because that everyone knows everyone um, but you've got like, usually like a restaurant area in a pub as well, quite often where you can just sit down and have a meal as well. But sometimes you can order, you've got two options. Sometimes you might have a restaurant in the pub and you might just have a bar menu in the bar side. So the pub might be split into different sections. Um, so you might have different menus in the different sections. Yeah, absolutely. And you might have different bar areas as well inside the pub. That makes sense because we're talking about bars. But yeah, so yeah, and pubs can, there's, you know, you can get, very friendly, uh, family friendly pubs as well. So a lot, you know, outdoor beer garden areas so that kids can run mm-hmm. around, play. And from age eighteen in the UK, um, you can order um, and drink alcohol in a in a pub or bar. And w- when we were back, um, we met people in pubs all the time with our little kids. So you can, your kids can come in with you and eat and have a coke or whatever in the in the bar and like they can't go up to the bar and actually order a drink themselves but like they can come and sit in there and have food with you um, and as you say you find some um we just used to google ahead of time to try and find some that have got like a playground outside so that when we'd had some food inside we could go inside and let them burn off a bit of energy and have a play while we cook with our friends but pubs are a good meeting place absolutely so um let's think of ways to save a bit of money when you're traveling around 
here in your um because... don't, don't travel with my husband <laughs> see that because he spent all of the money on all of the foods <laughs> did he put weight on yes yeah because <laughs> I found I did even though I was doing a lot of walking last year but I, I was doing a lot of that because I love afternoon teas which we haven't talked about but yeah, I love afternoon tea, which is different from high tea, but I'm not going to go into that into this. <laughs> he, he actually told my daughter that the water in England shrinks your clothes. Oh, that's it's good to know. Good actually, thing. I think the water in Australia is <laughs> shrinking my clothes at the moment. Um, but yeah, so uh, saving money, because I, I know, I mean, it's something that we, you know, we go, you go over there with on holiday or what you don't, it, it is expensive. So it's worth considering. So one thing that I do recommend is if uh, you consider staying in a B and B or a guest house because obviously bed and breakfast you get bed and you get breakfast. So you'll get a full English breakfast the following uh, from, uh, morning. So that's a good way to set yourself up for the day. Um, so that's what we did a lot of that last year where we um, we, we knew that we we're going to get a breakfast the following day. And yeah, Doug, I think Doug was getting to the point where he's like, not another English breakfast or Scottish breakfast because it, you know, it, it is quite a lot. So you've got to kind of consider that, but it is a good way to save a bit of money. Another good thing to do is to to consider going into some of the supermarkets um, and getting a meal deal. So basically you get a, um, a sandwich, um, piece of fruit, Cracker crisps, chocolate bar, and a drink. So one of those, so the sandwich, and then you'll get a choice between so the fruit or the um, chocolate or the crisp, and then a drink. Again, choice. And then they're around about, I think they were about four pounds last year, but you need to look at the different supermarkets that you go into, or you go to things like Tesco Express. So they're the smaller versions of the big supermarkets in the mm. UK. And if you're on the high street, you can nip into a lot of a lot of the shops like Boots. Boots, yeah. have got them. Yeah. Um, so that's a really good way, good way to save a bit of money because you can get a sandwich. Again, Greg's Bakery is a great place to go and buy yourself a you know a, a sausage roll <laughs> or a Cornish pasty, um, and they also do sandwiches in there as well. So they're they're reasonably priced. And then I know you were talking about kids eating free, Karen. Yeah, we um, we managed to try and do that where we could, but although the boys are now getting to that age where they want adult meals, yeah, and crumbs, <laughs> they want steak, some things like that. So <laughs> they were they were getting more expensive as we travelled around. But um, where we could, we um, tried to do the meal deals. So some different restaurants and pubs and things did a deal where if you ate on a certain time with one adult meal, you'd sometimes get a kids meal for free. Um, so that saved a little bit of money. Um, and but yeah, we, we ended up sort of mixing and matching what we were doing. I think sometimes um, it, it means travel. It means going into the pub at sort of a slightly different time, to perhaps when you were going to go. So I think times of things were like you had to eat before six o'clock in the evening or something. So you'd have to time your visit a bit earlier than you might have wanted to go. But if it saves you some money for the the meal, and it, it was worth doing some time. Okay, and that's a, that's a good thing to know. And also, I'm just going to quickly mention because it just popped in my head as well that there are a lot of chain restaurants in the UK as well. So you've got this like Pizza Hut, Nando's, Wagamama's. I think Pizza Hut's talking. good for an all-you-can-eat Pizza Hut yeah. buffet, which yeah. is my husband's the favourite thing to do yeah. with the kids. And um, where you just go and you pay a fee and you just stack up your plate over and over and over again. And, and Nando's, which is a, a favourite of uh, myself and Doug, so you get a, a chicken with different coatings and chips and. They do a really nice minty piece because I love the piece. So we actually were traveling around the country going to every Nando's in every city that we went to. Um, <laughs> to try where the best minty piece yeah. is. <laughs> and then um, there's uh, Wagamama's. There's quite, there's quite a few. I've actually got, I did take some photos of different menus. So I might actually put those in the Facebook group. So if you're not on our Facebook group, mm. um, pop over and I'll put some in the show notes as well. And there's some good Italian chains yes, as well. We yes. really like that because you can't. Prezzo. Prezzo, Prezzo's. yeah. You know kind of what you're going to get, ZZ's. Yes. You know what you're going to get when you go to them. And if sort of you've had a good meal at one of them, and, and I know our kids sometimes if they'd had some meals that they didn't enjoy, you at least knew you were going to get a good meal if you went back to one of the chain restaurants. So yeah, yeah. It's good to mix and match it and do a bit of everything, but uh, sometimes you just want a bit of comfort food that you kind of recognise. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, I guess my last tip would be um, is just to book. So book ahead if you want. You don't necessarily need to if you're going to a pub. But restaurant, but if you're going into on a Sunday, I would still check. Um, but do try and make make reservations. Uh, I, I say this based on the fact Doug and I were in the Isle of Sky last May and really struggled in Portree to actually get somewhere to eat because we hadn't made reservations. So it's it's a good idea. The same, actually, we're we're in York. We're in York over the Jubilee celebrations last June, and we had booked the first night. We didn't book the second night. We, we we were very. We actually met up with some lovely people from our group, and we went out for dinner with them. 
And we were actually very lucky to get into the Guy Fawkes Inn because that was the, a Thursday night, which was a public holiday. I, I don't know how it was a bit of a miracle actually when we just, we went in and, and they were like, "Yes, we've got a we've got a table." Um, because there were six of us, but we did manage to get in. But I wouldn't take a chance like mm-hmm. that. I, I guess is what I'm saying. So if you are, and I have got a list of different places to eat in the different um, travel guides to the different destinations in the UK on the website. So, so you can check that out. And I'm actually adding more. The more research I do, the more I'm adding in various places. But um, so you can get the details from there and make reservations. And sometimes you just. Phoning up a couple of hours ahead is enough. It depends on how popular the place is. Like if it's a really um, unique place that, like somewhere like the Magpie Cafe or something yes. at Whitby, yes. you need to kind of lock that in earlier than, rather than later. But then you might just kind of be sitting one afternoon and think, oh, let's go to this pub for dinner. Just ring up and see if we need to book for in a couple of hours from now. Yeah, um, I'll go online and check. I think it's always worth checking. I know, um, I mean, we, even in Edinburgh, we went to Macca's Gourmet mash bar which we always do uh, it was sunday evening and, and doug had actually walked up um, arthur's seat which i didn't do um and then i i, ha- I went to the restaurant and we managed to get a table for two we hadn't booked um and actually they were turning people away after that so you know asking have you got a reservation um so i think very much so the weekend or during school holidays public holidays really consider about making bookings or particular where there's not as many restaurants places like that Alice Guy really consider where you're going to eat and consider timings of when you're going to eat too because it depends where you are as to how late restaurants and pubs will stay open and keep serving so like a pub will stay open late but it's not always got the kitchen open to serve you food till the pub closes so um, they might close the kitchen at nine o'clock or, or half eight if it's a quiet night or something like that so it's always worth kind of thinking where you're going to be, because somewhere more uh, rural, somewhere more villagey, is going to shut sooner than yeah. London. You're going yeah, to absolutely. eat much later in London, but um, in somewhere more quiet, you won't be able to. Or they might close the um, close the kitchen for part of the afternoon and reopen later on in the day. Um, so that's worth considering. Obviously, like takeaways as well often open around about five, half past five. So kind of just bear that in mind. But otherwise, I think we've done a fairly good job. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go make some toast with Marmite now. <laughs> Hang on, are we going to talk about bread and different words? Oh, of we bread? are. This yes. Is, so this was a ah. controversial thing that oh. came up in the group the other day. We were, we were looking at. Ah, yes. Yeah. So we're talking about the fact that there are different words for um, bread, bread rolls in the UK. So I call them. Uh, I call it a bread, uh, a bat. So I would have a, a sausage bat, or um, what, what is it? You call it from? So I'm from Sheffield. Yeah. And they call a bread roll a bread cake. Right. Like bread cake, one word. And my friend, um, my old housemate, sort of, I don't know, 20 odd years ago, um, moved from Newcastle to Sheffield and moved into our shared house. And she went, we went to a baker's and they asked her um, whether it, she ordered a sandwich. And they said, Do you want it on a bread cake, love? And she went, Oh, oh cake. <laughs> Did you want it on a bread cake? And she was so baffled. She just, <laughs> I don't. I think she kind of walked out, just not knowing. What to yeah, do. I don't want to uncover. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. So you might hear um, bat, cob, bun, bomb cake, bomb which cake yeah, is a Manchester one. Yeah, batch muffin. Um, oh, and I'm going to mention a stotty because this is a, a definitely a, a northeastern thing. So a stotty is um, a bread roll, but it's quite big and flat. I really, I really enjoy them. So if you go into Greg's Bakery when you're northeast, chances are in you'll see that they have stotties filled with things like um, cheese and onion filling, which is delicious. Um, so you'll find those there. Another um, difference you'll find is actually sometimes in pronunciation as well. So I say <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> scone. And I say scone. So I'm, see, we're both kind of northern, but I'm still, I'm more northern. northern than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm more northern than the I'm cast. a little bit more midland really. Yeah, um, though Doug says scone. See, yes, okay. yeah, say my, scone. Yeah, my grandma used to say scone. Yeah, yeah. so you'll find that it, the the when the north will say scone, the further south you go, at some point there'll be a change. Well, this is interesting because I we I was having this discussion. We were talking about this podcast last night, and Matt said to me that he has always said scone, yeah. and he now says scone because I say scone. Really? So he's from the south coast, and I always associate scone as quite a posh. And a southern. So yeah, I, so I don't know. So it's interesting. Know. So you, 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 you know, whatever you, you ask for, if you ask for a, a scone or a scone, people will know what you mean. And there's plenty of pronunciation differences 
just in general, not just about food, just as you go oh, yes. around, you'll hear lots of different dialects as you go. But that's a that's podcast for another day. I was going to say, that's a whole other podcast because that toaster mama is calling my name, Karen. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to say again, a huge thank you to Karen for um, agreeing to do another chat and podcast and chat about food. Well, there'll be lots of information in the show notes of this episode about the different foods that we mentioned and the different, the different places you can find those foods and the tips that we've shared. Um, but for now, I just want to say thanks so much to Karen for coming on. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me again. It's always good fun. <laughs> Cheers, Karen. You can find the information about everything we chatted about in today's episode at uktravelplanet.com forward slash episode 38. That just leaves me to say until next week, happy UK travel planning. Thank you.